All right. You know, many of us in our walk with God, we desire to be in His favor. How many would agree? Yes. You, want, you want the best of, uh, that, that Yahweh has for you. You want to be in His destiny. But would it, would it be nice if there was like a YouTube video of like the ten bullet points of you got to do this to be in His favor? And maybe another one, a part two, that says don't do these ten things and be His favor. Wouldn't it be nice if there was just like some sort of like, I don't know, cheat sheet on here's what you need to do to stay inside of the umbrella. It's raining out there, but as long as you're under the umbrella, it's sunshine, flip-flops, and you got Tommy singing right behind you. How many would like that? Well, that is called the instruction manual. It's called the Word of God. And in one way, it's amazing, and in one way, it's overwhelming. Amazing in the fact that the God of the universe left this planet back in Genesis when He walked amongst Adam with real legs and a real voice, and He left with instructions. And it's amazing to me that He even left instructions. Think about that for a minute. He didn't even have to tell them not to eat from this and eat from this. He didn't have to. He could have just said, be led by the Spirit. He didn't even trust Adam to be led by the Spirit before he sinned. He gave instructions. And so tonight, I'm going to go through some things that I believe you always put on my heart. Very recently, actually, at 3 o'clock this morning. Another sleepless night for me. And I'm pausing because there's, there's some overwhelming things that are happening in Jim Staley's life. There's some things that are happening that I can't control. Meaning that I can't... How many could love to be in control of their life, right? I mean, if you could just, if you could just see everything ahead of time, you'd know exactly what to do. But then sometimes you walk out with no umbrella and it rains. And you take it as, oh my good, it's a terrible feeling to like go to Walmart or something and then you come out and it's a thunderstorm. You got groceries. Your car is two and a half miles from the front door. <laughs> no end in sight. And you look at it as a curse and what you don't know is God says, no, you don't understand. You need a bath. You don't see from my perspective. I'm blessing you. The rain is hard because you have some hard stuff on you. If the rain is soft, it's, there's not much there. But if the rain is hard, it's because there's some hard stuff attached. When the storms of life come and the things happen in your life that you think are too difficult, I want you to remember what I just told you. The more difficult the storm, the more difficult of choice that you are making or struggling with, it's because there's something inside of you that is difficult. So the title of this message that God gave me at 4 o'clock this morning was The Heart Speaks. The power of life and death is within you. You know, one of the most difficult things that we can grasp as human beings is how long eternity is. So let me just take a couple minutes. I feel led to do this. Didn't intend to, but I feel like I, I need to do this just so you can get a little bit of just perspective. Let's just pretend that there's a little bird out in the universe and he just flies around. And every one million years... He comes to the earth. And the earth is not the way it is today. The earth, let's just say, is one entire solid block ball of sand. That's all it is. It's just sand. And so every one million years, this bird comes to planet earth, and it takes away one pebble of sand and takes it out into the universe. Every million years. You wouldn't even know after billions of years that the bird had ever come because there's so much sand. Can you imagine that? Just one... Every one million years taking one grain of sand from one small beach, forget about the entire earth being 
filled with sand all the way to its core, but just one small beach, you would never even know that the bird ever came after billions of years. When the entire earth is completely finished, completely gone, and the centerpiece of sand that was in the core of the, of the, of the world is gone, that is one day in eternity. One day. Let me put it in a mathematical formula for those of you that are like me and just like math. I'll pull up my calculator just so you know I'm not making it up. So the average person, let's say that you are very blessed. The average uh, person lives 77 years old today. But I'm going to up it to 80 because you, you laughed a lot and laughter makes you live longer. So you lived an extra three years, so you're 80 years old. Now we're just going to divide that by 100 million years. One hundred million years. That's not eternity. That's, that's not eternity whatsoever. But that's a long time. It's not even close to how long evolutionists say that we've been around. That's point zero 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 eight. If you take 80 and divide it into 100 million years, you almost get zero. Now, for those of you, your eyes are crossed, and let me explain in mathematical terms what that means. If you could, I can't do any more than that because my calculator won't go up there. I tried. But if you continue to go to a billion years, you get to a place, even if you only calculated five digits, which this is seven or eight, 80 years, according to a calculator, is zero amount of time. Do you understand? That means from our perspective, it's 80 years. That's a long time. I mean, think about how much has happened in the last year. It's unbelievable. But in the scope of 100 million years, it's zero time. It should make the whole idea when your scriptures say that our life is like what? A vapor, a breath. It's like the dew of morning that's gone by mid-morning. Because our time on earth is this much. And that's just 100 million years. Add eternity to that, and you have this much. You have an infinite amount of zeros. Infinite. And somewhere at the very end of infinite is a one. Just to prove to the infinite God that time did exist. Somewhere in that direction. And why am I telling you this? Because your entire life and every thought that you have, everything that you do, everything that goes through your brain is because of what's happening in time from your perspective. How many of you, by, by a raise of hands, and this is just going to be one of those honest, gut honest questions, how many of you totally honestly feel like you have wasted time in your life? Some of you got three hands up somehow. I'm not sure. You get it. We waste a lot of time. Did you know that every single moment of your life is being recorded? You know, I got to sit on an airplane once next to uh, one of the head uh, guards for President George W. Bush and um, security detail. And uh, over the course of the, the few hours of the flight, we, we didn't become friends, but we began to talk and just converse, and we definitely had a, a, a click relationship there. Our, our personalities matched, and, and God was doing some amazing things. I was witnessing to Him, and He began to share some things about President George W. Bush, and He said, whatever you think about Him, He said this, He said, what you see on television is not the George Bush behind closed doors. And he said that, that, that George Bush is one of the most eloquent, articulate people, he said, I have ever met when there's no camera. 
But there's something that happens in politics that, is, it, that overwhelms the, 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 the system at times, and even for people to come onto this stage, that the moment that they understand that the camera is on them and they're being recorded and add a thousand enemies per state, if at minimum, that are taking your words, mincing every single one of them, chopping them out, and making you say something that you didn't say, you begin to kind of calculate your words and slow down your speech so that you can actually think through what you're going to say. But when you do that, it's so unnormal that you're bound to probably say something that you shouldn't say. And be the cutting and and budding joke of Saturday Night Live. If ever one of you knew that your life was being recorded to that degree and would be used against you every word, how would that change the way that you think before you speak? How would it change the way that you respond in any given situation? How would it change the way that you treat your your spouse, your children? Even the way that you treat your enemies. You might call it righteous anger, but the record button is flashing. Because let me just say this, man did not make what I'm about to say up. It came straight from the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, from the heavens. Whatever you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. You might say, well, Jim, I mean, are you trying to make God out to be some bad guy? No. It's a reality. Let's begin. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 21. First Samuel chapter 21. I'm going to read you a story that you may not be familiar with. It's David. Now this is the time before David became king. Saul is king. There's a schism in the, in the, the relationship. Saul becomes, begins to get jealous uh, over David because of, of a song specifically in a, in a way where it says David, Saul killed thousands, but David ten thousands at his side. Because David began to be, in a way, more popular uh, than Saul. And so there was, a, even though Saul and David were incredibly close at one point, we're in the process where the transition is about to happen. David came to Nob and Himelech the priest, to Imelech the priest. And Himelech was afraid when he met David and said to him, why are you alone and no one's with you? Basically, you are such a high status, I recognize your status, why is no one with you? What's going on? So David said to Himelech the priest, king has ordered me on some business and said to me, do not let anyone know anything about the business on which I send you or what I have commanded you. And I've directed my young men to such and such a place. Now therefore, what I... What have you on hand? Give me five loaves of bread in my hand or whatever can be found. The priest said, there's no common bread on hand, but there's only holy bread. And he goes on and he eventually gives David uh, bread from the holy bread, uh, holy place, this table of show bread, which is only for a priest. Okay, and not to go into a sidetrack, but this proves that, that David is a, is a priest. He couldn't have taken it if not. Now a certain, in verse 7, now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord, held back before Yahweh. And his name was Doeg, an Edomite, the chief of the herdsmen who belonged to Saul. So he's just standing by. David said to him, look, is there not here on hand a spear or a sword? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business, Saul's business, required haste. So the priest said, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, there it is, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. Unbelievable. I won't even go into that, but that's just crazy to me. That that, that the sword of Goliath is in the hands of the priest, the high priest, 
behind the ephod wrapped in linen. Can you think of anything else? Behind an ephod wrapped in linen. Ephod is the, is the, is the garment of the high priest. How about Yeshua Himself laid in a tomb, the high priest garment wrapped in linen? Think about the prophetic of this. It's the, the sword that Goliath intended to kill King David with. Who was Yeshua representing? King David. The very sword that Satan planned to kill Yeshua with is the very sword that's wrapped in linen that cut his head off. So the priest said, the sword of Goliath is here, for take it, for there's no other except the one here. And David said, "Uh, yeah, there is none like it, give it to me. David flees to Gath. Then David arose and fled that day before Saul and went to Ahish, the son of Gath. And the servants of Ahish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? The David's not king. Did they not sing of him to one another and dance and saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? Now David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Ahish, the king of Gath. Well, you have to understand this. This is hilarious. Like, I don't get David. What's going on? What are you thinking? Do you know who Ahish is? He's the king of the Philistines of Goliath's city. This is where Goliath lived. It's the king of the Philistines, and David goes, here. I'd be a little scared too, especially when I'm holding his sword. So David kind of freaks out, and he does something absolutely bizarre. He has nobody with him, get this, okay? And he's scared to death, rightfully so, even though he's holding the the sword of Goliath, which he probably can hardly hold to begin with. So he changed his behavior before them, pretended madness in their hands, scratched on the doors of the gate, and let his saliva fall down on his beard. He's acting like he's possessed. And the king said to his servants, because they, they brought him here. Basically, they brought him to kill, you know. And the king says, what are you doing? This man is insane. Why have you brought him to me? I, I ha- have I need of a madman that you have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this person come into my house? David was brilliant. So he just humiliated the servants because they thought they were doing a good thing. I'm going to bring the king, the guy that killed Goliath. And the, and the guy says, man, I don't care what he did. He's nuts. Get him out of here. What's the matter with you people? You thought you were going to make me excited. This is, this is terrible. So, so let me move into chapter 22. Let's see if we can skip down here for the sake of time. Yeah, so David departed, let's just start in verse 1, from there, and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his fathers heard it, they went down there to him, and everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. So he became captain over them. So you want to know who the, David's mighty men were? People all in debt and bummed out and depressed. So he became captain over them, and they were about 400 men with him. Then David went there from Mitzpah of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and mother come here with you till I know what God will do for me. So he brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt there all that time. And the prophet said, Don't stay here in this stronghold. Depart and go to the land of Judah. So David departed and went to the forest of Horet. When Saul heard that David and the men who were with him had been discovered, Saul was staying in Gibeah under a tamarisk tree in Ramah with his spear in his hand and all of his servants standing about him. And 
Yes. Verse 8, all of you have conspired against me. Saul stands up and says, all of you have conspired against me. There's no one who reveals to me that my son has made a covenant with the son of Jesse, and there is not one of you who is sorry for me or reveals to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as it is to this day. So he's basically whining. None of you are man enough to help me in this situation. Nobody loves me. And Doeg, who's Doeg? Remember Doeg the Edomite? The guy that was standing there, held back unto the Lord, where the high priest was that did nothing. All he did was watch what happened. All he did was he saw David come in said, I'm under, uh, I'm under instruction of the king to do this. I need some bread. The high priest said, okay. He has no idea what's going on. Gives him bread, gives him a sword. He leaves. That's it. That's all Doeg sees. Doeg steps forward, be, steps forward because he sees an opportunity to kind of be a hero here. And he says, Then answered Doeg the Edomite, who was set over the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse, David, going to Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of Etub. And he inquired of Yahweh for him, gave him provisions, and gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. So the king sent to call Ahimelech, the priest, the son of Etub, and all the father's house, the priests who were in Nob, and they all came to the king. And Saul said, Hear now, son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here I am, my Lord. Then Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, in that you have given him bread and a sword and have inquired of God for him, that he should rise against me to lie in wait as it is this day? Nowhere did this happen. So Amalek answered the king and said, I, and, and uh, who among all your servants is as faithful as David? Who is the king's son-in-law who goes at your bidding and is honorable in your house? Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Far be it from me, let not the king impute anything to his servant or to any of the house of my father, for your servant knew nothing of all of this. I didn't know anything, little or much. And the king said, you shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. He doesn't believe it. There's not a trial. There's no information given. There's no jury. There's not even facts given. There's one witness Saul is about to break Torah. Do you know why? Because the law of God says that only on the matter of two or three witnesses can a matter be established. A judgment cannot be made on one witness, no matter how credible it is. So the king said to the guards who stood about him, Turn and kill the priests of Yahweh because their hand is also with David and because they knew when he fled and did not tell it to me. But the servants of the king would not lift their hands to strike the priests of the Lord. Then, and the king said to Doeg, you turn and kill the priests. So now what's going on? This is interesting. Really amazing story that I'm going to unpack here in just a moment. Doeg, the Edomite, the one who just slandered David on information that he thought was true, convinced of that was true, And to save the entire empire, the other guards wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. I suspect some of them knew Torah. I suspect some of them knew Samuel was probably somewhere around here. And I don't want his wrath. I certainly don't want the wrath of of our God to come down against me for killing the high priest. Are you kidding me? So the one who made the accusation was required to do the bidding of the death he had already spoken with his mouth. And the Edomite turned and struck the priest and killed on that day 85 men. 85 priests were killed from an accusation of one man who simply observed without knowing. No knowledge, no understanding. Is what he said true? Absolutely. If you read the account, the only thing he told Saul is exactly what he saw. What did Saul do? Saul interpreted what he heard. Technically, this guy, Mr. Edomite, just told the truth. Right? But God required him to be responsible for the death of the priest. 
Saul would be removed over this action eventually. But it was the Edomite who spoke this into the words and the ears of Saul, knowing what Saul was going to do because the motive of the heart was to get on the good side of Saul. That's it. The motive was promotion. The motive was I'm going to do something in my favor. And I can promise you, ladies and gentlemen, that that Edomite had no idea that he was going to be the one required to slit the throats of 85 men wearing the linen ephod. But he can't back down now. He's already jumped in. You following me? The power of your words. This is what is so incredible. What we get from this story. It doesn't matter whether something is true or not true. The rec- record button is flashing. And there may come a day when you may find out on Judgment Day that you killed 85 priests. And you thought you were saving a kingdom. As we walk through the Scriptures tonight, we need to be very open with our hearts. This is not going to be a feel-good message. If you came here looking for the encouragement and the pat on the back, understand that God is an encourager and He loves to pat His people on the back. But most of the time, the pat is like a good parent when a child is choking. It's pretty tough. It's a pretty good hit on the back. And tonight is one of those. To wake us up to the God of the universe's recording. People are dying at the words that we say and the words that we do not say. How many know that there is a scripture that talks about the seven deadly sins? There are seven deadly sins. Let me just say this again. Deadly. That means not life, death. These are what they are. Let's walk through them. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 through 19 says, There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to Him. You better pay attention to that seventh one. There are six things that the Lord hates. Here we go. Number one, haughty eyes. Those that look at themselves higher than others. Number two, a lying tongue. Number three, hands that shed innocent blood. By the way, you, you, we instantly think of abortion, many of us, you know, and, and absolutely that is part of that definition. But in this definition here, that Edomite shed innocent blood. And the only thing he did was tell the truth with a motive that was selfish. Number four, a heart that devises wicked plans. You know, you don't have to sit down and go, how am I going to blow up the bridge today? But many of us devise evil in our, in our plans and wicked plans because the word wicked originally in English etymologically comes from wicked. It's two strands of cotton that are twisted together. That's where you get your candlesticks originally from. It's wicked. Something that is connected and twisted. It's not evil. There's a difference. I don't have time to go into that. They are connected. But there's a difference between evil Pure evil and something that's wicked. The tree of knowledge of good and evil was wicked. It was a mixture of good and evil. Number five, feet that make haste to run to evil. What does that mean? How many of us, when, when we're, we're, we are a, a voyeuristic society, are we not? Let me prove it to you. How many have sat in traffic for miles only to get down there and there's an accident on the other side of the highway? Have you ever wondered, how does this happen? Why is our side of the highway blocked? Because of their accident. You know why? Because we all love to peek into things that are crazy. Things that are disturbing. You can walk down the side of you know, an aisle in Walmart and you'll hear somebody saying something really bad about somebody else and you will slow down. What are they saying? Oh, I think I heard a lady at church with name. What was her name again? I think that was her. 
We love to peer into things. You know what that is? That's a feat that runs to evil. Number six, a false witness who breathes out lies. A false witness who breathes out lies. And don't let this next statement be a shock to you of basically what we just read. That Edomite was a a false witness, was he not? Because he gave the impression that David was doing something wrong, that the priest was doing something wrong. He told the truth, and he absolutely thought that what he was doing was the right thing. But in God's court, that's called a false witness who's breathing out lies. You see, it doesn't have to be intentional lies. You don't have to be. This is where it gets really scary, ladies and gentlemen, because you can actually be telling the truth and not knowing you're killing people and will be found in contempt of God's court for breathing lies. This gets way more complicated. And it should make us hesitate and pause. Because so often, we're the first ones to vote for ourselves, to be mayor of our city. The reality is, you best keep your hand down because you may not be as qualified as you think. Best let someone else vote for you. Number seven, and what? The one that's an abomination to him is one who sows discord among the brothers. It's an abomination. What is an abomination? You'll see an abomination is a sacrifice to an idol on a high place. To Ishtar and Baal. That is an abomination. The Bible says an abomination to to take your children and pass them through the fires of Molech. You get some context of what abomination means? Killing young children alive, burning them. He uses the same word here. You sow discord among the brethren, or you tear down someone's reputation, which we'll get to in just a moment. You are like someone who takes a child that is alive and burning them in the fire to another God. That is dangerous in his court. Because Yahweh, Yeshua, left with only A few prayers, and at the top of the list was, Father, make them what? One, as we are one. The intent of Yahweh, the intent of God is that we would be one. We don't always have to get along, but we do have to be unified. This is this this tonight is a warrior speech. This is about showing you that you are a soldier in the kingdom of God. And some of you don't know the rules and you don't even have the armor on. And the armor that you think you have on, you don't even know, will not protect you on the day of judgment. We'll get there. So let's just define these. According to dictionary.com, gossip is a rumor or talk of a personal, sensational, or intimate nature. Number two, a person who habitually spreads intimate or private rumors or facts. Let's get to another term that's, that's used all the time, or it's done more often than not, is this word, slander. You know, many of us don't know the definition of slander and what the difference between gossip and slander is. I'm going to share it with you here in a minute, and this comes also from, from uh, dictionary.com, and it also comes from the legal definition. I'm going to show you the legal definition of slander. Because how many know we live in a litigious society today? People are suing each other for everything. Did you know this is one of the most, the highest lawsuits in the land that are filled with slander lawsuits? Here's why. Because the definition is oral communication of false statements that are injurious to a person's reputation. You know what the Bible calls this? Murder. Slander is murder. That's where, that's, it's one of the top ten. It's murder. Because you're ruining someone's reputation with a false statement. Now let me ask you this. Does it say that you have to know it's false? No. You can actually think it's right. Didn't the Edomite think it was true? Absolutely. So your motivation doesn't matter in a civil court of law. You cannot stand before a judge and say, well, you know, I thought it was true when I said that. 
I totally thought I was doing the right thing by exposing this person or this or that and the other. The judge says, what you did was illegal because it's not true. It's called slander, and that is against the United States law. Take him away and put him into chains and punishment. Number two, a false and malicious statement or report about someone. Again, you don't have to know what you're saying is false. This is where it gets complicated. How many of us intentionally go around hurting people and saying false things? Very little if you are a follower of the Messiah. You shouldn't be doing those things. But how many of us will share with somebody else something that you think is true? But you've never even talked to the other person or the other group or the other party to verify it? That's dangerous. Because the moment it comes out of your mouth, you cannot take it back. The record button is flashing. It's against God's law. Let's just walk through a bunch of scriptures here, and we're going to lead to a, a, an ending. Proverbs eleven thirteen: 13, whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets. Now, I thought that's what we're supposed to do is reveal secrets like this. Oh, he's got a secret. I'm going to reveal it. Who says that you're supposed to reveal secrets? But he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. Does that mean that you don't approach someone on their sin? No, if you see somebody in private sin, what are you supposed to do? Go to them in private. You see, some of you say, Jim, I remember you preaching this message a year ago. Well, yes. But God has put a new spirit in with me, and the ending of this message, I think, is going to be a little bit of a curveball for you because there's something that we're not doing that is hurting the kingdom of God. Leviticus 19.16, You shall not go about as a talebearer among your people. Nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You are not supposed to go out and gossip among your people or bear tales. That word in Hebrew is slander. You're not allowed to say things about other people that is negative, even if it's true. It's against God's law. You can't do it. Even if you say, I'm doing this for the sake of humanity to save the rest of the world from this person or that person or my dad or my uncle or my boss. You can't do it. There are exceptions to the rule. The exception is life and death and when someone of authority calls you into court. So if you are summoned to court, according to the law, you are required to testify and to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. It's the same way in God's court. Until you are called, you are not allowed to publicly slander or criticize. Titus 3.1, listen to this. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, including the President of the United States. I don't care who he is. To be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. Not just those that are good people. Show humility to all men, even the ones that are puffing their chest up to you. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. How do you hate someone? I'll give it away because I'm going to go through these scriptures. You slander them. That's a, one of the number one ways in how the Bible describes hating your brother is these, malice, envy, and hate slandering. Exodus chapter 23, 1 says, you shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. You cannot join someone that's mixed. You can't do it. It's against the, let me just say it in, 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 in a language. You can't be friends with someone that is slandering. 
Oh, Jim, you're judging. I'm quoting Scripture. I'm sorry if it hurts your feelings. Why does God say you can't be friends with someone who's a slanderer? Because it is, allows the enemy to penetrate the body of Messiah and divide and conquer the seventh most abominable sin that he hates. Do you want to be responsible for letting the enemy in to your life or your family? Slander is hatred. And by the way, you might be thinking, well, I don't do this. Well, just hold on, because it may not be about you. James chapter 4, verse 11. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the Torah and judges the Torah. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. Let me say this again, because this happens so much. We love to judge one another. Now, let me me just talk about this for a second. Get out of my PowerPoint going here. Matthew 7, 1 says what? Do not judge lest you be judged. And with the measure that you judge, you'll be judged also, right? Don't take the log out of, uh, the speck out of your brother's eye until you take the log out of yours, right? It doesn't say don't try to take the speck out of your brother's eye. It says don't take the speck out of his eye until you take the log out of your own eye. And it doesn't say you cannot judge. Matter of fact, it says that you're supposed to judge one another. And the judgment starts with the household of God. We are required to judge one another. The confusion in American civilization right now is the difference between judgment and condemnation. We don't understand the difference. And so we don't, want to, we don't want to judge anything. We don't want to judge homosexuality. We don't want to judge abortion. Let me just say it in Bible language. We don't want to call sin, sin. Because we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings that might be in sin. That is no different to watching a child walk out in the middle of a busy street and say, I don't want to judge them. They can go out and play in the street if they want. Who am I to tell them that they shouldn't do that? as they get run over. The church is being run over. Edmund Burke said this, it only takes one thing for evil to prevail, and that's good men doing nothing. And we have a bunch of good people in the church that do nothing around the world. And evil prepares. Evil prevails. The Bible says that if, so let's get back to the scripture in James chapter 4. What does it mean then to do not judge? It's this. It's not saying that you can't judge. It's saying you better have the authority to judge if you're going to judge. There is a difference. A judge in the civil court system, a police officer, has the right to pull you over. What is he doing? Judging. Little digital thing says you're going 17 miles an hour over. I dare you when you roll down that window and say, Officer, you're being intolerant. Quit judging me. (laughs) And then roll the window back up as fast as you can. You're not going to get too far. It's not that we're not supposed to judge. You just have that half. You must have the right to judge, or you must keep your mouth shut and pray. You do have the right if you see something. Let's say that you're walking through a forest park and you see a problem, and somebody is beating up somebody, and you see a police officer over there. What are you supposed to do? Go get the police officer. What are you doing? You are appealing to a judge. But you are not responsible to get in and mix when there's a judge in the courts. What happens if there's no police officer? You appeal to the situation, but ultimately there's 10 people there. Your job is not to judge. Your job is to appeal to what you think that you see. You may not even know what's going on. You just see a fight. You really don't even know who's the good guy or who's the bad guy. You can't judge. You can appeal. Let's keep going. 
If you decide to judge and you're not in a position of authority to judge over that person, you are literally judging the Torah. Why? Because the Bible says that the Torah is the judge. It is the foundational instruction manual that will be used at the end of time by Yeshua the Messiah. He will use His Word to judge people. So if you use the Word to judge people and you're not been given authority by the lieutenant to judge, you're stripping the Messiah of His authority, making you the judge. And ladies and gentlemen, that doesn't play good on Judgment Day. This is why we cannot make judgments on things we don't even know about. And even when we do know about them, the best thing that you better do is pray according to Scriptures. Do you know why? Because the Bible says, if you don't humble yourself and pray, you might be vulnerable to the enemy stealing your heart in the process of judgment and making you susceptible to bitterness and anger and murder yourself. Because how many of you would look at something that's really bad and condemn someone or judge someone for killing a little girl and then your anger rises up? Absolutely, and that's normal. And I know this is controversial, but you don't have the right to judge that man or condemn them. You have the right to make the statement that that is sin. But even in that moment, I'm telling you what God is showing me, you better walk on eggshells when you call anything sin unless you absolutely know and it's been evidenced by two or three in a courtroom with witnesses and cross-examination. We don't have the right to look at someone across the aisle and say, I don't like what they're wearing, and judge them. You don't know them. Maybe you're right. Then do something about it that will help them. Pointing fingers at someone and telling someone, what, you know, not even telling them, but telling someone else what they're doing is wrong doesn't help the kingdom of God. It divides. I hope this is making sense. A worthless religion. James chapter 1, verse 26 says this, If anyone thinks that, he is, that, he, that he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Let me just say this. You can say, you know what, I've got the Bible memorized. I'm following the Scriptures, the Word of God. I keep the Sabbath. I, I eat all, only apples. I do everything that God wants me to do. The Bible says the first time that you slander someone, say something negative about someone, or damage the reputation of someone else without being a judge, your religion is worthless. Now, as I walk through the Scriptures on this, the reason why I'm passionate about this is because I'm starting to get a little nervous. Because the way these Scriptures are written, if He means what He says, that means that someone who does this on a consistent basis that stands before God, He's literally going to say, your religion is worthless. I don't care how many people you raise from the dead in my son's name, how many of you cast out demons, and how many people that, that you raise from the dead, or whatever, heal people. In my, it doesn't matter. Depart from me, you wicked, lawless person. Wait a minute, Lord. I kept your law. I studied your law. I went to service every week. I, I did this. I did that. He says, your religion is worthless because let me show you how much damage you did in my kingdom. You slaughtered 85 of my priests and you didn't even know it. And then he brings up the moment on the screen of that comment, that one little line on Facebook that's there forever. And someone walked away from God because of it and you didn't even know. And every one of their generations are lost. And that blood is on your head. That's some context from God's perspective of why it's worthless. The ninth commandment. 
Exodus chapter 20, verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You cannot bear false witness against your neighbor. And ladies and gentlemen, in this context, we're talking about a courtroom scenario. You're not allowed to bear false witness. And most of us, if I ask to raise a hand, most none of you have ever been called to a courtroom inside of a spiritual atmosphere. In other words, something goes wrong or you hear something online or this or that. There's never been a courtroom. There's never been an exploratory committee. You've never been called to the witness stand. And we're bearing false witness outside of the courtroom. How much more judgment will there be if someone bears false witness outside? Some of you are so good at this, you could preach this sermon. But hold on, because there's something you're not doing that makes you criminal to everything I'm talking about, and I'm included. And when God showed me this, it shook me to my core. Romans chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself. Because you, the judge, quote-unquote, God's being sarcastic here, Paul's good at it, practice the very same things. Well, I don't do that. I don't, I don't do that. I, that person does this. And then Yahweh says, stop, rewind, play. Hits the big screen, and up comes your sins. And you say, wait a minute, whoa, 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 stop. Whoa, stop. I, 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 I. He said, no, 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 that's just the category of speech. Let's go into your thoughts. Lord, no, please don't do that. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not done. We, we haven't even got, there's action one too. Remember that thing you thought you got away with? And, yet, and you are trying to tell this person that they made a mistake or they're in sin, or from your perspective, not being a judge from a thousand miles away, heard something four times removed. And you think you have the right to make that statement, to make that judgment, to pull this away from this person. You destroyed 85 of my priests, sir. You're doing the same things. Because the Bible says this, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Every one of us have made mistakes. Now this does not mean, this message does not mean that we let people get away with sin. Not at all. But there is a channel, my friends, if you follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, He has a system and a plan for that. And we best go through it. Now, unfortunately, in the diaspora, we're in a messed up society where we don't have enough congregations. There's a lot of independent contractors that are out there that love God with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength. Those aren't independent contractors. Because they're under authority of the judge. They may not have a local congregation and be held accountable because they're out in the middle of Saskatchewan. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're out in the middle of nowhere. But you still love Yahweh with all your heart and you are subject to His Word. That means you're subject to the court system. The best that is around you. But there are those that are outside or inside and their heart is so rebellious they can't even take instruction or barely encouragement from someone else without closing down, closing off, and submitting themselves to God's Word and going through Bible things and Bible ways. Oh, they'll claim with their mouth, I love you, God. And in the next moment, they're writing an email, making a chat, texting someone something that's hate speech or slanderous or at the very least, negative the government is not the only one saving everything you do Romans chapter 1 verse 28 says and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of... Look, watch how this next line comes in order. It's incredible. Every time you see this, they're in the same order. Envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are gossip. 
gossipers and slanders, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, listen, who know the righteous judgment of God, meaning that they know that God is the only one that can judge. And they still do these things. That those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Do you know how you approve of slander? You might say, I would never approve of gossip or slander. Go on Facebook. I, I, I wanted to do this, but I refrained. I want it to, because it's so easy to find slander on Facebook. F Google my name. You, you, you'll find it. Find a post that has slander or gossip and how you approve, you like it. And it sickens me that someone can actually say terrible things about someone else on Facebook and someone will like it. Now, this is a scary statement, what I'm about to say, but my Bible says this. I don't care what you think about your salvation. My Bible says that you deserve death. You are a hater of God, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, even if that person did whatever they're accusing them of. You're having no mercy. Proud, boasting, that's what the thumb is. Backbiters, listen. Whispers. Ladies and gentlemen, you say, I would never be described like that. I would hope not. But this, series, this subject is so serious, it's literally one of the only topics in the Bible that the penalty is death on every level. He hates it. It's an abomination. He says it deserves death. Yes, the wages of every sin generically is death. But this is it. You almost don't find Less than 10 sins in the Bible that individually require death. This is in the category of homosexuality and adultery and idolatry and the killing of little children. Wow. Hitting like on Facebook? He'll never look at it the same again. You better not, because every like and every unlike is being recorded by a flashing record button. And he's going to pull it up on Judgment Day, and he's going to say, did you really agree with this slanderous statement? Really? You destroyed 85 of my priests. Proverbs 18.8 says this, The words of a talebearer are like a tasty trifles, and they go down into the innermost body. Everybody loves tasty trifles. Everybody loves chocolate. That's what gossip is like. It's like chocolate. Everybody wants a piece. Give me a piece. Give me a piece. Come on. It's like an open bag. You don't know it's poison on the inside. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20 says, For I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish, and that you may find me not as you wish, and that perhaps there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, here it goes, anger, hostility, gossip, conceit, and disorder. They all come in that. In, that, in other words, what it's saying is this. This is what you will see surrounding someone that does this. They're hostile. They're slanderous, they gossip, they're conceited, and there's always chaos everywhere they go. They produce it. Ever heard of the term, uh, you know, they blew up my Facebook page? Somebody says something negative or positive or they want it to be negative, and what happens? Your whole Facebook page just gets blown up. I know of a pastor this week that said that someone went on their Facebook page, on their church Facebook page, and started slandering with a violin, because how many know you can slander in a nice way? Complaining about 
how they have a bad relationship with one of their kids. And people are, are falling into the, oh, I feel so sorry for you. I can't believe that your son is acting like that. It's not me. That's slander. You're putting someone else in a negative light on a church website. That's got to be something worth worse on Judgment Day. It's not even your own page. And then this person went on to say, come to my page to see all the rest of the details of what other people say about this person. Can you believe that? And you know what everybody did? Like choice chocolates, like Hansel and Gretel, they were led away to the slaughter because every gossip and slander showed up on that Facebook page and slandered this person and other people. Like, 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 like. They know not what they do. Proverbs 25, 18 says, A man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a war club, a sword, and a sharp arrow. You see, ladies and gentlemen, there's two, two swords, there's two clubs, and there's two arrows. Either you will be a hand in the hand of Yahweh or the hand of the enemy. But someone who bears false witness is the arrow in the hand of Satan. Matthew 12, 36, if you don't believe me, it says this, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Because in Hebrew, devar, word, is an action. It's not a philosophy, it's not a spoken word. When God speaks, what happens? Something happens. When you speak, something will happen. You either create or you destroy with your words. I will tell you, after God showed me this and began to download this to me at 3 o'clock in the morning last night, I tell you this, I'm probably never going to say anything bad about anybody. Ever. I run across the worst person I've ever seen. I say, I like their haircut. <laughs> Praise God, it's about the only thing. And then I just blew it. Slander is a fool. You do, and do a homework for those of you that love Bible study stuff. Do a homework assignment on the word fool. Look it up and see what a fool is. Every single time in the Bible, a word study on the word fool, it will shock you how many times it's connected to this subject. Jeremiah 6, 28, they are all stubborn, stubbornly rebellious, going about with slanders. They are bronze and iron. All of them act corruptly. Proverbs 10, 18, he who conceals hatred has lying lips, and he who spreads slander is a fool. Listen, do you know most of us slander? We, every one of us have done this. And almost 100% of the time, it comes out of hurt and pain. Our spouse did something terrible. You found him in adultery or, or pornography, or, or your boss you know, cut your hours or did something. Most of us slander out of hurt and pain. And the moment you do that, you have put yourself in the hands of the Torah as the judge of all mankind and condemning that soul. The, the Lord doesn't say you have the right to judge when you're hurt. Matter of fact, when you're hurt, you're supposed to pray for your enemies. Love them. Have mercy on them. Let me just throw this out because tomorrow's judgment day, let's say. Tomorrow's it. Let's say we just absolutely know. Tomorrow's it. Tomorrow's judgment day we have to prepare right now. However much mercy, and by the way, in the next 24 hours, you're going to get hurt 14 times. 14 times someone's going to hurt you. However much you show mercy in the next 24 hours depends on the mercy that you get from God. One for one. Every time that you, you even had a feeling of hurt and anger that wasn't in check, He shows up on the screen something that you did on Judgment Day the next day. Would it change the way that you treat one another if you knew that every moment you spoke something, thought something, or did something, a moment was allowed in heaven on Judgment Day against you. 
He who conceals hatred has lying lips, and he who spreads slander is a fool. I love this scripture. I thought, what are we talking about? What does that mean? He who conceals hatred. Think about this. The, let's say it backwards. He who is lying is concealing their hatred. It means this is why they do it. They're full of hate. No, they're full of hurt. And if you saw what Yeshua saw, you'd be praying for them. He didn't rebuke Peter. He rebuked Satan and said, get behind me. Because he saw the enemy. He had the right eyes. He had the compassion and the love to see into the heart that they were being manipulated by the enemy. And the hurt and the pain that you were receiving was not coming from them. It was instituted and originated from the enemy from the garden that destroyed Adam and Eve, which all of us have been now receivers of. You see, we only slander and gossip and hurt one another and break the very law that we say that we want to keep because we don't see eternity. We see the 80 years. We see them, and, and forget that, we see the only the right now. We only feel the feelings. We must do something with the feelings. And the enemy's right there to give you ideas. You know, you have the power within you. When someone says something negative about you on Facebook, or I'm just, whatever, whatever your situation, I'm using Facebook as an example because it's the most slanderous atmosphere. And you know that you could destroy that person with the information that you know. What you choose to do depends on your eternity. What you choose to do determines your eternity. You think you're talking about salvation? I may be. Because there's a lot of evidence here that says that salvation is attached to the things we say. Everything we say gets judged. And some of it's called death. Not enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, let me ask a question. How many of you have ever slandered? Raise your hand. My hand is up. I'll do it twice. Just for full honesty before the king. That makes you a slanderer. So let me ask a question. How many times do you have to do that before it's over? I don't know. I'm not the judge. But I can tell you, I don't want to remotely get close to that line. Ever. Here's our prayer, what it should be. We're wrapping up. Psalm 141.3 Set a guard, O Yahweh, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Because it's so tempting. Let me tell you something. If anybody ever says anything negative about me, and, there are, and there's somebody that absolutely doesn't like me, don't say anything positive about me in front of them. What? Just so you make sure that you heard me correctly, do not say something positive about someone in front of their enemies. Why? A righteous man once said, if you say something positive in front of someone's enemies, you will immediately cause them to sin because they will immediately start blaspheming and slandering about that person. It's their instant reaction. Isn't that true? This person's a good person. No, they're not. The moment you said that, you caused them to sin. This is what it says. Do not cast pearls before swine. Do not defend a righteous man. You know what God spoke to me years ago and He said this, does a lion of the forest defend himself? Who needs to defend themselves? The moment you defend yourself, you are admitting that you do not have a defense. I do have a defense attorney. And so do you. His name is Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah. And there will come a day where He will defend you. But every moment and every situation that you defend yourself, He will not legally be able to defend you because you already did. Who would you rather defend you? Yourself or Him? 
because your enemies will not listen to you and they don't care about your defense anyway. How many have you been able to convert? But on judgment day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he's the judge and shame will come over the people of God. Where we all think, and everybody in most churches can't wait for Jesus to come back. Woohoo! I can tell you that the righteous do not want to see that day. They do on the inner heart, understand what I'm saying. But the righteous understand that that day will be full of shame and sorrow. Out of what? out of the mistakes that they've made and how they looked at themselves this way and how God actually looked at them this way because of their sin. Because of the 85 priests that they killed. Old rewards will be handed out, no doubt about it. Where do you want to live in the kingdom is the question. And are you sure you will even make it? Who desires life? Psalms 34, 11 says, Come you, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of Yahweh. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Here's the answer. Keep your tongue from evil. He could have said, believe in me. (laughs) He says, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek shalom and pursue it. What's he saying? Keep your mouth shut. Keep your eyes on me and pursue me. Let the world say what they may. The only reason why you got offended anyway is because you got pride. So someone calls you this. Someone calls you that. Someone falsely accuses you. So what? If you are offended, you don't have it happen to you enough. Walk with me a little while, and God will train you to just let it fall right off your back. It's okay. You'll eventually get it right. You'll eventually see that they are hurting. Nobody hurts except from hurt. Your offense is only caused from your pride. If you see people the way God sees them, you'll take a nail or two. Here's the result of slander, and this is really shocking. Praise Yahweh, He's the judge. Psalm 5.5, 5, the boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. You shall destroy, listen, you shall destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. When you see Facebook posts blow up with negative information, that in biblical terms is called bloodthirsty. If one single thing they say is false, the Lord says, I abhor it. They're a slanderer. They're a gossip. They're a dividing of the brethren. They are like their father, the devil who steals, kills, and destroys my people through deceit. It is a characteristic of the enemy. Psalm 119, 78 says, Let the proud be ashamed, for they treated me wrongfully with falsehood, but I will meditate on your precepts. It goes on to continue to say in Psalm 101, 5, Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Who, listen, if you slander your neighbor secretly, you will be destroyed. Let me put that in today's language. You start a fake Facebook account to slander someone, that's called slandering someone in secret. It doesn't matter if everything you're saying is true. There's no secrets in the Shemaim, in the kingdom of God. There's none. The record button is blinking. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. He who works deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence. Early I will destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off the evildoers from the city of the Lord. When God comes, no one's living in his house or in his city that does this, or it's like, 
or does nothing. Yes. How many of you read and do nothing? The Bible says it is as if you wrote it. The ancient sages says that the one who listens to slander or gossip is worse than the one who actually spoke it. Because why? They had the chance and the choice to save a life. And they chose to watch it happen. It's no different than when Hitler was giving his instructions to his soldiers to shoot a Jew with a rifle. And you stood by and watched it happen. And you said, I didn't pull the trigger. I didn't hit like or dislike. But you read it, you watched it, you observed it, and you did nothing. You are not a servant of my kingdom. You are an observer that wants the keys to my kingdom. I'm telling you, the gravity of this is unbelievable to me. And today we've been talking about today's slander platform, no doubt about it, is Facebook. Can't believe we have to put a message, and inside of a message of a preacher is Facebook. More lives have been, more people have committed suicide because of this platform. Not the platform itself, but the way it's been used. It's unbelievable. Just heard of one just a couple of days ago. Somebody started a Facebook page just to slander this junior high girl, calling her all these things, saying all these things that were all false. She couldn't handle it. She committed suicide, and they went on to mock her in her death. Incredible. Examples of slander. I, absol- I, I cut and pasted this off of something I found. It's easy to find stuff about me, so it's the easiest for me to find. Someone said this, cult leaders, and I'm only using me as an example because it was the fastest for me to find something and, and to make a principal point. Cult leaders commonly have their flock break all ties with family and friends. This is not generally seen except in a cult situation when both the leader and their following are doing this it does raise some flags. Where does this come from? Someone, someone it's a part of our ministry, has, got a, has issues with their parents. And they're going through counseling. And their mom didn't want to go to counseling anymore. And so there's an issue. And this person has no idea what's going on. And so because they heard this online, because the mom posted her thoughts and her diary on a Facebook page, and made it sound so bad that her son was so bad. People began to slander this person that have never met and brought yours truly into it as if I condoned it completely and forced them to do it. Now let's just put this, well, let's just keep going and I'll make my point in just a second. Jim Staley does not have the spirit of Messiah, but one of the manipulation and divisiveness. Now, right or wrong, that's a slanderous statement. I'm not mad. It doesn't bother me at all. I'm fearful for this person's life. Like Yeshua, they know not what they do. It doesn't have to be me. It can be anybody. I'm praying for for eyes to be open and hearts to to be tender towards God. I love and miss my son. I got permission from this person to to put this up here. Now what is, it sounds good. The reason why I'm showing you this, by the way, and just using this as an illustration so you can recognize slander when you see it because it comes in every form. This statement is incredibly slanderous. How would you say that? It doesn't seem anything wrong with it. I'm praying for the eyes to be opened and hearts to be tender toward God. I love and miss my son. It sounds so good. But what it's implying is there's something wrong with my son. Pray for my son. Do you see that? 
There's poison in this post because there is an assumption that she is the one that's being perpetrated against and the son needs prayer. When no one has a single fact of what's going on. Not a single thread of fact. And so people went on to say, we're praying, for the, we're, praying for your, we're praying for you. We feel so sorry for I can't believe your son would do this. Your son would do They don't even know what their son did. You follow me. This is not a post that you keep. Any righteous person would rebuke this person in a moment's notice and say, ma'am, you don't take your feelings of your personal situation and diary on Facebook. You're causing people to look at your son in a negative light. The Bible calls that slander. You're in dangerous water. Do you follow me on this? Because you would never have, most people would never see this as slanderous. And I would say this if I didn't know who that she was talking about. It wouldn't matter, me or anybody else. What's your responsibility, ladies and gentlemen? You can't remain silent. You can't remain silent. There's hundreds of people in this room, and that affects, on Facebook, millions. Add up all your, all your Facebook fans. Hundreds of thousands, at the least, of people that watch stuff happen. They watch people rape people online, beat them, slander them. I can tell you this, there was thousands of people that read those Facebook posts of those young teenage boys slandering this girl, and they said nothing as that girl killed herself. I bet they wish they would have done something. How many have done nothing and 85 priests died and you didn't know it? Proverbs 20, 19 says, He who goes about as a talebearer reveals secrets, therefore do not associate with one who deceives with his lips. I ask a question because I don't know the answer. The moment, let's just bring this just with Facebook because it's such a big deal, but you can put it in your life as well. The moment someone slanders and they don't receive correction, how is it possible that you maintain them on your side? That you let them be a friend? That you have not defriended them? Because my Bible says, do not associate with one who deceives with his lips. You must, listen, I'm saying this, we're not being mean. This is called holding the ground of the righteous. This is called being a soldier for Christ. Soldiers are not changing diapers and telling everybody they're doing a good job. Soldiers sometimes have to do hard things, like follow the Bible. And the Bible's going to give you instructions right here. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Some of you have friends that are gossips. Did you know that is completely unbiblical? I'm the meanest pastor ever, I know. I'm ruining your life. After all, how many friends are you going to have left after this message? Come on. The Bible says that you warn them. Most of us do nothing. So here's what you do in practical terms. If someone is on Facebook and they say something that even smells or puts anyone in a negative light, you private message them and you warn them. And you require them to go back on your page and apologize. If they do not repent, you immediately defriend them and block them from ever posting on your side again because your Facebook page, ladies and gentlemen, is your life in a way. You're displaying who you are. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Would you allow a slanderer into your temple to slander your God? My Bible says that whatever you do to the least of these, you're doing unto Yeshua. If you let someone on your page to do something to the least, 
you are approving it unto him. I know this sounds like I'm judging. This is called righteous judgment. Following the Scriptures is not judgment. The Bible gives us the ability to do this, and you are the authority over your life. You have the keys to your house. From God's perspective, let me give you a visual. This is what He sees. You are a very top, and you have a left, and you have a right side. Everybody in blue is every person. You only, you only influenced one person in a negative way. See, what you don't know is they went on to influence two other people, and they went on to influence two other people. Did you know on Judgment Day, every one of those blue people are attributed to your head? Your account gets debited on all the negative influence into the kingdom of God. In the same way, you drew someone closer to God. Maybe you led them to Christ. Maybe you, maybe you actually did the right thing in private mess with someone, and then you posted on your Facebook, I will not, like a local pastor did. I was so proud. He said, I will not tolerate slander or gossip, even in the subtlest ways on this page. How dare you call yourself a child of the living God and slander another child of God? That is righteousness. Imagine if everyone defriended every single person, then their intent is wickedness and evil or to play their violin to put someone else in a negative light. Imagine how strong the ranks would be if we turned our face away from evil and refused to let it in. Maybe then the evil would get a clue. Maybe those that call upon the name of Christ and they have no one to talk to, maybe then they will see their sin and repent of their evil ways. Because God knows i got enough evil ways in mind to, to repent for, don't you? I don't have time to poke on someone else. If you're doing the will of God, you don't even have time to look at the sin in your brother's eye because your eyes are closed and on your knees for your own. People are watching you. Most people have no idea that it's a hundred to one. For every post, there's a hundred people that read it. People are watching every word you say, everything that you do, every thought that you have is being recorded. Everything. You have so much ability to have influence. Use it for the kingdom of God. Don't stand by. And this is not just about negativity. Do something nice for someone. Post something encouraging. Use the influence. Thousands of people are watching. You will not only be judged, get this, if this doesn't just already depress you to the nth degree to go home and repent and dust and ashes, you will not only be judged by every word, every thought, and every deed that you do, you will be judged by every negative influence that you've had into the kingdom of heaven. You'll be judged by every positive influence that you brought into the kingdom of heaven. And then, if it's not worse that than yet, is that you will be judged on what you could have done. And that should scare you the most. Because there's only one entity in the universe, Yahweh Himself, that looks inside of your heart and He knows what you're capable of. He knows it. I'll never forget when I was a financial planner and I was making all of this money, I felt so good that I left a $100 tip to the pregnant waitress when I could have left a 1000 I will be judged not on the $100 tip. I, would, I will be judged on Judgment Day for what I could have done. The difference is my judgment. He doesn't say, good job, Jim. When $100 didn't touch 
the mortgage that she can't pay because her husband left her the day before and she's due next week and you gave her a hundred dollar tip and you think that you're good. You didn't even offer to come help her or buy her dinner for the next month. You didn't even get her contact information to pray for her. What could you do for God? The judgment is the difference. Lastly, where are you leading people? This is you in the middle. You see that arrow? You're either leading them towards or away from wherever you're going. The scary part is many of us don't know which way we're leading people. And as for me, when I was in junior high, praise God, my entire spiritual life started here at a Christian camp when the guy that was a a leader had the courage to take me aside and warn me, like the Scripture says. He warned me, and he basically, the way I tell the story is, took me and threw me up against the wall by my collar, because this is what God did through him, and said, you are leading people both towards God and away from God. Choose this day whom you will serve, because you're a leader and you don't even know it. And I looked around and I said, what are you talking about? I'm not a leader. I'm just a junior higher. He said, you're leading people away from God one minute, and you're leading people towards Him. Do you know what that's called? That's called lukewarm. And the last time I checked my Bible in Revelation chapter 3, he says that he will vomit that person out of his mouth. It's apropos that this slide would be the very last one, just a default slide on a, on a Mac. Because one day you're going to meet what's back there. You're going to meet that light that you're looking at right now. You're going to stand before the Almighty God for every single thing that we've said, done, thought, didn't do, could have done. The enemy, we know, the characteristic that caused him to fall was pride. So would it interest you that the number one problem of man is pride? We think too highly of ourselves. The only way that you can slander someone is that you think too highly of yourself. Because if you really saw the depravity of your own heart and the mistakes that you've made, see, we're really good at forgiving ourselves, aren't we? We're really good at forgetting our own sin. Some of you are too hard on yourselves and you bring your sin with you. You're close to the right place. Your perspective is just slightly off. Where God wants you to be is He wants you to be in a place where it is judgment day right now. And you hold yourself, you abase yourself, you tear your clothes and sit in dust and ashes, and you beg for God's mercy now. Because you understand you're reprobate and you don't have the right to judge, to slander, or to even agree when you don't have all the information. Even God, who has all the information, sees the prostitute on the street and, and, the, and the tear falls because He knows what happened to her when she was a little girl. And you don't. And yet you will judge. We will judge because we love to hit the brake and look at the accident. And not a single Christian drives by and even prays for the one in the ambulance. Where is the conviction? Where is the Spirit of God today that loves people? The Spirit of the living God died for enemies. And we curse them. When will we learn to love like He loved? Because judgment day is coming, ladies and gentlemen, and eternity is at stake. Don't just assume that you're going to be waltzed up to the front and given one of those thrones. You may not even make it in the city. You might say, I I just want to get to heaven. What if your seat and your throne is on the other side of the earth and you never even get to see the glow? of the city. Oh yeah, 
You're glad to be in the kingdom. Eternity, and you never actually get to see the king but once, and that's on judgment day. Better than being in, in Hades, I get it, with you on that one. But I'm putting it in perspective. I don't know about you, but I want to live in the radiance of the city with the sun from my king. And the only way that you're going to get there is if you're on your knees, keeping yourself to yourself. But when it's righteous time, you stand up and you do righteous things. You do not let sin prevail when it's in your power to stop it. But you can only judge when you're in the authority. Your life, your authority. Someone else's life, pray. Appeal to their authority. Don't take your stuff online. You might kill 85 priests. Think about it this way. I personally know people that have not chosen to discover the roots of their faith because of the slander that they saw online. Ladies and gentlemen, the blood of those people is on the heads of those posts. If they knew that hundreds decided to not be in covenant with their God or maybe even deny God altogether because maybe their life is so full of hatred and anger that when they got online, they looked for an encouragement and they saw a blow-up thread with believers destroying one another and they decided, I'm done with God. And they walk away completely. Never will those people online ever see it, ever know it until judgment day when the, the king turns and says to the scribe, how many people did this person lead away from me? And he says, 482. Wow. What are you going to say to your king? Please stand with me. No, please don't. I'm just sensing we need to sit before our God. Matt, can you come up for a second? I know it's been a little bit long. But this is something God put in my heart. I didn't have time all week. God kept me doing other things and just doing all kinds of things in my heart, breaking things from me. I said, God, what am I going to speak about? And at 3 o'clock in the morning, he said, show them how to love because it's what I'm going to judge on. You know, sometimes your greatest enemy is yourself. Most of you prevent yourself from your destiny out of your own fear, out of your own anxiety, out of your own hurt for whatever happened to you. God says that not only has he given you a second chance, but he gives you the power to actually speak for him. Think about that. The creator of the universe gives you authority to defend his book. And he says it's a good thing. I'm certainly not advocating, advocating being mean to people. But ladies and gentlemen, there's enough of it going around out there. It's time that we stand up for God. Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for holiness. Call a spade a spade in love. And let the Holy Spirit do his job. And if you think they're getting away with murder, they're not because the record button is flashing. God showed me a vision this week. This morning, actually, super early. And he showed me eternity. And it's not at all what I thought it was. It was not at all. If, if you said, draw me a picture of eternity, you could not have thought of what I'm about to share with you of what I saw. But he showed me myriads of people as far as you could see. As far as you could see, myriads of people. And he let me look into their hearts and I saw their eternity. And some of them were people that hurt me years ago. 
and I began to weep because God showed me the chains, the darkness, the lack of rewards, the hurt and the pain and the shame that came over them for their actions. How dare I even speak a word now on this earth against even those who hurt. Their eternity is waiting them. Their judgment is waiting them. And see, the transition of your pastor went from being kind of excited about their judgment, revenge. And now God has changed my heart completely. It breaks my heart. To see people from across the United States hurting each other. It's not even righteous anger anymore. It breaks my heart because I know, according to my scriptures, everything is being put at stake by murdering someone else. And every person that just watches it happen, their judgment is pending as well. Where is Gideon's army today? Where are we? Why don't we do things for God? Why don't we live for Him, breathe for Him? Everything we do, everything. I'll end the way I began. 80 years, guys, and you're not even guaranteed that. According to statistics, 50% of you won't even make it to 65. Your life is a vapor, gone. And we think 80 years is a long time. Methuselah, 969 years, if I remember right. That's a long time. That's going all the way back to, to the, crusade, to, to the uh, Knights of the Templar and way before Christopher Columbus. A thousand years is a long time. Are you sure you're prepared for eternity? Most preachers will talk about salvation, and that's definitely something that's part of it. But are you ready to be judged? Because the God of the living universe broke my heart as he showed me my own anger. The moment I became angry at something that was done against me is the moment I sinned. We don't love God like we should. Most of us live just above hurt. But loving your friends is one thing. That's hard enough. But let yourself be crucified and die for someone that don't like you or someone you've never met online. Standing up for a little girl that you didn't even know that you saved her life. You'll never know. What if she didn't commit suicide because someone private messaged her and said, don't even listen to a single thing that they say. You are beautiful. But the reality of history shows on Judgment Day, God will show you the alternate reality that if you wouldn't have made that post, she'd have killed herself. You saved her life. You have the opportunity to change the world. Some of you think, oh man, only the Jim Staley's of the world with a big platform have the opportunity to make a big impact. No, you have a tremendous opportunity to change the world. It only took 12 to change the world and they didn't even have the internet. Go figure. You can change the world. The only difference between you and them is they gave their life, they dropped their nets, they did everything and they breathed God. They breathed the blood of Yeshua. They, they died martyrs all but one. What are you doing for him? Are you building your kingdom? Are you building his? Because there's only two towers, his and Babel. Now you can stand with me. Father, I just come before you in the name of your great son, Yeshua the Messiah, that you gave us to free us from sin and to free us from the bondage of hate. Deep down inside of every single one of us, we are angry at something or someone. And sometimes we don't even know it because it's hidden behind the smiles. God, I call out to your people tonight and I say, let go of your hate. 
see them as the Messiah sees them. Some of you may say tonight, with all heads bowed and eyes closed, I don't even, I don't, man, the way you're explaining this, if I died right now, I'm not even sure that he would let me in the kingdom of heaven at all. I've never dedicated my life to God the way that you're talking about. I need a second chance. I need a second start right now. If that's you, raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep your hands up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All over the auditorium. It's not enough to raise your hand. It's not enough to read a post. If you want to rededicate your life right now, tomorrow's judgment day, I'm going to ask you to get out of your seats right now. Step aside. Come down to the front and kneel before God and get it right. Meet with, with our altar team that's coming down now. Tell them what's on your heart. Tell them what's going on. Get it right. Get it right now. Repent before your God for the judgment that you've made against others. Whatever it is, I, I'm not even going to give an invitation. I'm just going to say, if, if you are feeling God tugging against your heart and you know that you need to get something right before Him, come down to this front and make a, a visual stance for your belief system right now. Make it right. If you're at home tonight and you are feeling a conviction of the Holy Spirit for the things that you've done wrong, do whatever it takes to make it right because if tomorrow's judgment day you will be judged for what you don't do and what you have already done so the bible says if you humble yourself before men he will exalt you on judgment day but if you choose to not humble yourself before men he will humble you it's your choice if you've wronged someone right now ask god to forgive you and then give you the courage to make it right. Maybe that means you gotta send an email. You gotta, you gotta post something online. Stop the train of wickedness in our churches, in the congregations of our God. Father, we just come before you on behalf of those that are making it right, Lord. I pray you to extract the bitterness out of their life. Lord, I pray you give them a spirit of love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Father, I pray that you give us a heart for the lost that don't know you. Father, help us to stop judging, to start standing up for righteousness, to see through the wiles of the enemy, even when they come in the most subtle ways. Yahweh, thank you for saving me. I'm a, I'm an, I am a wicked sinner, and I certainly don't deserve your love. But Father, on behalf of all of these people in the sound of my voice, we thank you for sending your Son to die for us and give us life so that we can live more abundantly. Lord, I pray that you would wipe the slate clean right now for every person that is crying out to you right now. Forgive them, God, for they did not know what they were doing. And for those that did know what they were doing, Lord, give mercy to them. Have mercy. Father, we bless all of those that have hurt us, that may continue to hurt us. They may even mock us for blessing them. They may even think we're guilty because we don't even respond to accusations. Father, you are our response. We love our brothers. We pray, God, that you would have mercy. Father, I pray you change the fabric. Change the fabric of your congregation of Israel. Make us stand up for what's right. Take away the blinders from our own eyes and help us to stop being our own enemy. The speed bump to our own spirituality and help us to see what is obvious in front of us. Whatever it may be. Grow us up, God. Make us righteousness. 
in the land. I know we're filthy rags in your sight, but God, help us to display the character of Messiah and love people and stand up for what's right. Amen. May the Lord God bless you. May He keep you from the path of unrighteousness, the path of complacency, the path of neutrality. May He be gracious to you, give you mercy for the mistakes that you've made. May His countenance his face, his presence lift up over you. May he protect you from the darts of the enemy, the deceptions of Hasatan. And may your soul on judgment day be given peace. Amen. Just ask that you just stay in a spirit of prayer and love and concern for those that are making things right. And for those of you that are wherever you're at in your spiritual walk and what you're going through, please don't be a bystander. Make a difference. Lock arms. There are lives depending on it that you'll never see and never know. You are dismissed. I love you. We will see you next week. Shabbat Shalom.